So welcome everybody to the uh, July Grand Rounds for physical therapy and occupational therapy, athletic training, and speech. Uh, I'm Steve Caraha, and we have Dr. Massey uh, talking to us about patellofemoral assessment uh, and regional interdependence. So uh, w he and I have uh, no conflicts of interest to disclose, um, and we will proceed from there. So I'll turn it over to him. Well, let me start off by saying good morning to everybody. Thank you for getting here nice and early on a, on a Wednesday morning and giving me the opportunity to speak in front of you all. Um, so a little background on why I chose patellofemoral syndrome and the assessment and regional interdependence this morning to speak to you all. Um, when I first came out of PT school, God bless you, I thought that this was one of the more challenging pieces of uh, rehab and more challenging presentations that a patient would come with. Um, particularly because it seemed like there would be no two patients with this diagnosis that presented the same way. Some individuals would have pain with more intense kind of plyometric activity, where others would have pain sitting in the car for a couple hours, which made it a challenging rehab process. Um, so that's kind of what led me to do a little bit more research and speak to you all today. So, oops, let's see here. Learning objectives for this morning then is hopefully by the end of this presentation you all will be able to understand the functional anatomy and the kinematics of the patellofemoral joint, be able to explain the importance of regional interdependence as it relates to improved functional outcomes, identify risk factors related to developing patellofemoral syndrome, and determine appropriate interventions to improve function. A little bit of an introduction as it relates to patellofemoral syndrome. So patellofemoral pain is one of the most common complaints of knee pain there is in athletes. However, it's not just limited to athletes. It can also affect adults and anybody across the lifespan. So statistically speaking, approximately 21 to 45 percent of adolescents and 15 to 33 percent of adults are affected by this. Females are at a higher risk than males. Uh, and it was once believed that this was a self-limiting diagnosis. However, more research has been done on it, which is now determining that this may actually increase the risk of developing patellofemoral osteoarthritis later on in life. So as far as making a diagnosis of patellofemoral pain, um, these patients will typically come in with subjective complaints of anterior or retropatellar knee pain that's associated with either prolonged sitting or weight-bearing activities. Uh, specific weight-bearing activities during a subjective history that you may want to ask is difficulty with squatting, kneeling, running, going up and down steps, getting up and down from a chair, um, getting up and down from a low surface like a toilet or from a couch, um, and any type of plyometric activity that may go on for an individual such as jumping, hopping. Um, there is no gold standard special test that we can perform in the clinic which makes it more, it makes the overall history taking portion of the exam that much more important. However, if you do include a step down test, that does increase the likelihood of making an accurate diagnosis of patellofemoral pain. So some research has indicated that if you actually include a step down test and it's positive, that'll increase the likelihood of a diagnosis from 40% to 65% with a positive likelihood ratio of 2.34. Now, 2.34 positive likelihood ratio, not the best likelihood ratio out there. So use your clinical discretion and use your clinical judgment. But just know that if those types of things do go ahead and become positive during your exam, that may lead you to more of the diagnosis of a patellofemoral pain. So why do we care? Why do we care as physical therapists, occupational therapists, athletic trainers? So what I wanted to do then was give a little bit of a background on this. So there was a study that was performed that was a two-year cohort study that took a look at school-age students ages to 15, 19. Um, so students were asked to answer an online questionnaire. And what they did was they filled out demographic question first, age, height, sex, um, and then they were shown a pain mannequin. Based off of that pain mannequin, they would mark the different areas that they were experiencing pain. So if individuals then marked that they were having pain in their knee, they were then reached out to via phone and were asked a couple more questions. The individuals then that were found to have pain that was anterior in their knee of an insidious onset with no trauma were then offered an examination by a rheumatologist 
And then those patients were examined by the rheumatologist and they were given a diagnosis of patellofemoral pain if they had anterior knee pain that was going on for six weeks or greater, an insidious onset, there was no trauma, and also if they had pain with two of the following, whether it was prolonged sitting, kneeling, squatting, going downstairs, or any tenderness to palpation along the lateral aspect of the patella. So based off of this then, they, got, they, were either to get, or they were able to gather 121 participants with a diagnosis of patellofemoral pain syndrome and 351 participants with other types of knee pain. So the two years went by, and then the statistics on this, in my opinion, are rather alarming. So after two years of knee pain versus patellofemoral pain, 52% of the adolescents with knee pain not related to patellofemoral pain reduced or stopped participation in sports. And sports could be whether it's competitive or recreational on their own time. But on the flip side then, 71% of adolescents with patellofemoral pain reduced or stopped participation in sports. So if we look around the room here, that's almost three out of four of us would stop or reduce our overall physical activity level. So on the surface, it may look as, okay, this person's just presenting with a knee issue. However, the more that we dive into it, we all know that if somebody has less physical activity, that's going to mean decreased cardiovascular health, which is going to increase the likelihood of having a higher body fat content or a higher body weight. And we all know that that then decreases the overall, <coughs> excuse me, decreases the overall health of the individual. So this is what makes it an important issue and an important topic to be aware of because early intervention and prevention can go ahead and kind of prevent that domino effect from occurring later on in life. So the relevant anatomy of the patellofemoral joint is we have the patella and the femur. So the patella is down at the distal end of the quadriceps tendon and sits comfortably in, hopefully it fits comfortably in the uh, trochlear groove of the femur. However, individuals that have a sh more shallow trochlear groove are more susceptible to shearing forces and instability of the patellofemoral joint. The tibia also plays an important role in the patellofemoral joint, which we'll learn about later. If there's any types of rotations or positional faults within the tibia, that then can also lead to an increased knee valgus force, thus shearing the patella more. Important muscles around the patellofemoral, uh, patellofemoral joint are not only the ones that are acting directly on it, so we think traditionally our quadriceps, all, all parts of the quadricep muscle, hamstrings, IT band, but also we'll learn a little bit later of muscles that don't necessarily have a connection to the knee, but actually affect the overall alignment of the lower extremity, such as your glute medius. And then also you have your medial and lateral patellofemoral ligaments that help to provide more stability to the patella itself. So while everybody's sitting here, I know it's a little cramped in here. Before we go to the next slide, I want to see if everybody can put their hand on their knee then, right along the kneecap. I want your palm to be right on your kneecap. And I want you to try to extend your knee out nice and straight and then bring it back down. Extend, bring it back down. Some of us are probably getting a little bit of a click in there. I'm getting a little bit of a click. So hopefully what you felt then was that as you were bending your knee, you felt your patella go ahead and migrate inferiorly, go down towards the ground. And then as you were extending your knee, you felt that patella go ahead and come back into your contact point into your hand. Those are the normal kinematics of the patellofemoral joint. And as we go through the different ranges of motion, there are different contact points on the patella that go ahead and uh, handle most of the force through there. So at 45 degrees of flexion, the middle aspect of the patella is receiving the most amount of contact pressure. At 90 degrees of flexion, the superior one third of the patella is receiving the most amount of contact pressure. And then anything beyond 90 degrees, the load shifts inferiorly and laterally onto the patella. So this is something just to keep in mind as patients are going through functional activities or going through everything else throughout their course of life in here, is that the as you go ahead and as you go through that range of motion, that contact pressure is going to change on the patella. So etiology of the patellofemoral joint and patellofemoral joint pain. So research has shown that it's now multifactorial in nature. So things such as your lower extremity alignment can affect the overall uh, shear forces that are going on at the joint. Um, something that we may not think of is if somebody has foot pronation, that can go ahead and cause a tibial internal rotation, which is then going to increase the valgus stress onto the patella. 
And then also a hot topic that we always see with patellofemoral pain is a muscle imbalance or weakness. What I alluded to earlier, though, is that there are some challenges in the rehab with the patellofemoral joint pain syndrome because there's considerable individual variation throughout each person. Just because somebody presents with or has a diagnosis of patellofemoral pain doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to present the same way across the entire board. So that brings us to the next topic then of regional interdependence. So regional interdependence is the seemingly unrelated impairment of separate and anatomical regions which may contribute to the primary complaint of the patient. So for this particular talk, we'll see how the hip involvement results in knee pain, but I'm sure we've also had patients where hip involvement has re resulted in low back pain, or hypomobility in the thoracic spine could be resulting in neck pain, or even thoracic spine hypomobility resulting in shoulder pain. So this just signifies the importance of not only looking at the specific joint, but also making sure you investigate the areas above and below, looking at the entire patient to truly determine what are their specific impairments that are causing their specific pain syndromes. So talking about hip then, so hip weakness and its effect on the patellofemoral joint. So individuals with patellofemoral pain have been shown to have weakness in their hip compared to individuals without pain, or without pain in the patellofemoral joint, rather. So uh, if a patient comes in with a diagnosis of patellofemoral pain, they're more likely to demonstrate excessive hip adduction and internal rotation, which has been associated with weakness of the hip abductors, extensors, and lateral rotators. So during functional activities, though, the role of the hip and the trunk also get called into play. So during functional weight-bearing activities, subject, or these individuals has all, have also shown minimal hip flexion and, forward, and a forward trunk lean, along with an ipsilateral trunk inclination, all of which go ahead and create more demand on the quadriceps muscle, thus shearing the joint even more than what it's already being sheared. So all of this together with the increased knee valgus from the alignment and the increased type of calling on the quadriceps there sets somebody up or predisposes somebody for more forces going through the joint than what the joint was built to handle. So one particular study then took a look at individuals that went through functional stability training or FST versus our traditional quad strengthening that we think of when treating somebody with patellofemoral pain. So 31 recreational athletic females between the ages of 18 and 30, and 30 were recruited for this study. And they were deemed athletic as anybody that completed 30 minutes of either aerobic or athletic activity three times a week. So it doesn't necessarily have to be somebody that plays soccer for their school or uh, semi-pro or pro. So what they instructed to do for both groups was they asked both groups during the first two weeks, this was an eight-week study, during the first two weeks, patients were asked to not complete any of their aerobic or athletic activities that would cause knee pain. So if we break it down into the two groups then, so the functional stability training group, which included hip strengthening and trunk strengthening, during the first two weeks, they focused strictly on enhancing trunk and motor control. The subsequent three weeks then, they worked on enhancing trunk and hip strength using weight-bearing activities. And then in the final three weeks, they went ahead and increased the difficulty of those exercises. So along with the hip strengthening, though, they also were doing the same strengthening exercises that the quadriceps strengthening group was doing strictly at the quad. If we look at the quad strengthening group, then, they did traditional strengthening of, or stretching of the muscles around the knee, so hamstrings, quads, IT band. And they did weight-bearing and non-weight-bearing exercises that focused strictly on quadriceps strengthening. So the results of this study, they went ahead and they used, a, they used pain and LEFS, single leg hop test, kinematics, and trunk endurance as the overall outcome measures. So pain, at the conclusion of the program, both groups did have lower levels of pain. However, uh, compared to the quad strengthening group alone, the functional stability group did have statistically significant lower levels of pain. At the three-month follow-up, only the group that incorporated uh, quad and hip strengthening has statistically lower pain levels. As far as the functional outcomes of the LEFS, the, this was on the threshold of statistical significance, so we'll take it with a grain of salt here. 
Um, both groups did go ahead and both groups did show improvement in functional outcomes, but again, it was on the threshold of statistical significance. As far as the single leg hop test is concerned, only the FST group had higher scores than what they did at baseline. Kinematically speaking, only the FST group had a decreased ipsilateral trunk inclination, had decreased levels of hip adduction, and also decreased levels of knee abduction. And then finally, as far as trunk endurance is concerned, um, the group that focused on trunk and hip strengthening increased trunk endurance compared to the group that just did quad strengthening and quad stretching. So clinically, what this means is those individuals in the group that incorporated the entire lower extremity had lower pain levels, increased function, improved kinematics, increased trunk endurance, and improved eccentric hip and knee strength compared to those that only did the quad strengthening group. So this again kind of hits home on that importance of looking at the areas above and below the joint, looking at the individual as a whole, and hitting their specific impairments. Now, going on to the next topic then, is something I'm sure that we've all seen on scripts when we get the diagnosis of patellofemoral pain. Um, can anybody think of what the intervention is going to be with that script? Just yell it out. VMO. Yep, VMO, 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 and more VMO. So um, the question then that I'm going to ask you all to think of then as we, as we go through this and kind of think through your head there. So weakness related to the vastus medialis oblique or the vmo relative to the vastus lateralis i want you all to kind of go through your heads think of the anatomy of these muscles here think of the innervation of these muscles and try to think in your head if you had to go ahead and clinically in vivo in the clinic go ahead and specifically say that the vmo is now weaker than the vastus lateralis, not having any type of equipment, just doing a standard MMT. Show of hands, anybody here think that they could, without a doubt, say, yes, I can prove that the VMO is weaker than the vastus lateralis? Good. That's the right answer. <laughs> so, um, and anybody that was too shy to raise their hand, good job on not raising your hand. <laughs> so, if we look at research then for these types of subjects in here then, they also talk about delayed firing of the VMO compared to the vastus lateralis and any other portions of the quadricep muscle. So there's been inconsistent findings in research as it relates to this. Some studies have shown actual delayed firing of the VMO, where others have shown that there may be delayed firing, but there's not statistical significance with that delayed firing. Um, but also then, how do we determine what's clinically relevant for us? What's the threshold? At what point does this delayed firing go ahead and actually play a role with the patient? Um, one of the ways, though, that we can look at the overall strength in different areas of it is if we were to go ahead and look at muscle fiber thickness. So it's widely accepted that the overall thickness of a muscle will go ahead and demonstrate the overall ability of the muscle to create its maximum contraction or the maximum amount of force output. And I think we're all in agreement that the thicker the muscle, more likely the, strong, uh, the stronger the muscle. So what a couple of researchers ended up doing then was they did a study that looked at the overall thickness of the quadricep muscle and the different areas of the quadricep muscle. So this looked at 18 to 40-year-old females that were symptomatic for six weeks or more with a diagnosis of patellofemoral pain. So exclusion criteria was they couldn't have any types of history of surgery, any significant injury to the lower extremity that resulted in a period of non-weight bearing, no signs of low back pain with it, and no diagnosis of internal knee derangement such as a meniscal tear, ACL tear, or any other sources of anterior knee pain. This could be a patellar tendonitis or a bursitis type of thing. So what researchers did then was they took ultrasound measurements of the actual thickness of the different areas of the quad and they compared it to the symptomatic laid versus the non-symptomatic laid and unilateral pain, uh, symptomatic individuals. So here's a picture, I don't know if you all can see it too well, but here's a picture of the different contact points that each individual went ahead and had measured through ultrasound to look at the overall thickness of the muscle. So what researchers found then was individuals complaining of a unilateral pain um, each portion of the entire quadricep muscle was statistically significantly smaller 
than compared to the asymptomatic lane. And there was no statistical significance between limbs that was found between the thickness of the VMO, the vastus lateralis, the VM, or the vastus lateralis. So, and also, there was no significant difference in quadricep thickness of individuals with patellofemoral pain compared to a matched control group, matched in terms of age, gender, and uh, weight. Um, but the takeaway point from this is that interventions aimed to be targeting just VMO and not the entire quadricep muscle may not be justified for this population if the entire muscle itself, the entire quad, has the thickness deficits compared to the, to the asymptomatic leg. So just something to kind of keep in mind when we see some of those scripts that come through. It doesn't necessarily mean that VMO strengthening doesn't need to go on, but it might not just be the only thing that you want to honker down on and thing that you want to focus on. So what about the non-athletes? So far we've discussed a lot of these research studies that talk about athletic individuals or individuals that are more physically active. Does this relate then to the population that's more sedentary in life? So this particular study took a look at sedentary women with unilateral patellofemoral pain. They were aged between 20 and 40 years old, and they had complaints of pain greater than three months. Um, things that increased their symptoms were increasing pain with going up or down stairs, squatting, jumping, kneeling, long sitting, isometric knee extension, so quad setting. Um, and they also had tenderness to palpation with the, uh, to the medial and lateral aspects of the patella. So they were broken up into two groups then, a knee exercise group, just like the, old, the, the previous study that we saw, versus a knee and hip exercise group. And also they used outcome measure-wise an 11-point numeric pain rating scale, the LEFS again, an anterior knee pain scale, and a single leg hop test. So I don't know if you all can see that or not, but these are the different exercises that each group went ahead and went through then. So on the left here, it breaks it up. The KE group is the knee exercise group only. The KHE group is the knee hip exercise group. So as you can see, the KHE group went through the same protocol as the knee strengthening group alone. However, um, they also incorporated exercises that focused on the hip. So they were doing hip abduction with weights and a side lying. They were doing a lot of stuff with bands and standing. They were also doing rotations and also doing hip extensions in the open and closed kinetic chain. And so you can see some of the pictures over here then of the different exercises that they incorporated to focus on the hip. So here's the results of the test here broken up into they have the baseline and each of the follow ups following on here. So for anybody that's a numbers person you can look at the numbers here and kind of analyze them. Um, but so essentially what ended up happening was that if comparing the two groups here with it, um, statistical significance between groups with baseline and three, six and 12 month follow ups, the knee hip exercise group had statistical significance in better outcomes for all functional measures compared to just the, uh, the knee exercise group, the knee exercise group alone only had statistical significance with decreased pain while going upstairs at six months, decreased pain going downstairs at three and six months, and with the single leg hop test at three, six, and 12 months. Like I said though, comparing the two groups to one another, the knee hip exercise group had significantly less pain and better functional outcomes um, on all of the different occasions. So then what does this mean for us as clinicians then? Um, Patients with patellofemoral pain syndrome are likely then to benefit from strengthening of the hip musculature, specifically the abductors, external rotators, um, also extensors as well. So that being said, EMG studies have also been done to see which, which exercises kind of specifically activate the gluteals without causing in or bringing in too much of TFL or tensor fascia lata involvement. So what that uh, EMG study then found was that incorporating clamshells, a unilateral bridge, uh, being in the quadru uh, quadruped position, performing hip extension with both a straight leg and a bent knee, called on the gluteals more with isolating the TFL. Now, there were weight-bearing and non-weight-bearing exercises that were performed in this study. 
my initial thoughts was that I thought that the weight bearing exercises would actually go ahead and bring in more muscle activation. Um, so I was kind of surprised to see that more of the kind of open kinetic chain uh, was more, uh, there was more open kinetic chain compared to closed kinetic chain on here. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't include closed kinetic chain exercises with our participants because that's more functional. That's more, so it's always important to, to kind of take things and use your clinical judgment where we can go ahead and we can work on the open kinetic chain with person, with people, but if a lot of their pain and a lot of their symptoms are in the closed kinetic chain, we also want to make sure that we're addressing those impairments as well. So that being said, there are also some other interventions that we can go ahead and we can use to kind of um, support the other exercises that we've been doing with individuals. So a lot of times we'll hear about McConnell tape or tailored tape towards the individual. Also, there has been a recent study that's come out that has discussed mulligan tape and the effectiveness that it's been used on patellofemoral pain. Um, something too that people may not have thought about using before was a high-grade lumbopelvic mobilization on somebody that's presenting with patellofemoral pain, um, and then also manual interventions that we'll go ahead and, and discuss in here as well. So for this portion, I brought a couple pieces of tape here. Now clinically, for McConnell taping and for mulligan taping, we would use more of like a Luco tape, a brown tape that's in here. Um, this is going to be similar to skin color, so I'm going to throw out the disclosure. I brought in blue tape so people could go ahead and see the actual taping technique that we're going to use. But keep in mind that in the clinic for a McConnell tape and for a Mulligan tape, usually a Luco tape is what you were going to use. So I just want to keep that in mind with everybody. Um, so then, so let me get our table set up here with everything, and we will go through some of the different taping techniques that. Steve or the scissors, if they fall on the ground. Thanks. Yep. All right, so the first technique that we'll go over then is. The technique that we'll go over then is kind of the McConnell taping that was in there. So research has been done to justify McConnell taping. Um, a systematic review was, was done. And what they were trying to do is they were trying to look at subjects to determine um, if the McConnell tape had an effective immediate response on the individual. And what they were looking for was a, was a reduction in pain by 50% during a functional activity that caused their pain. So there's three different types of technique on here or with it. And what this talks about is that tailoring, making sure that you're doing something specifically for the individual. Um, so if you're looking at your individual and you see that your subject has a lateral patellar tilt, the top one might be a good option for you to try to decrease the tilting of that patella to decrease the amount of shear force. Um, taping to control a lateral patellar glide. So during a quad setting activity in there, you see that their, the, the kneecap is going out and shooting out laterally. The middle one would be an appropriate one. And then lastly, um, if there is any type of lateral spinning of the patella, this also might be an appropriate technique on there. So for time purposes, um, I'm just going to show one of the Mulligan technique or one of the McConnell techniques on here with it. Um, and so my subject here is actually my future wife. So I know with her, her specific knee has uh, a lateral to our letter B in there. It says she has a lateral patellar glide. So I'm going to go ahead and tape her knee to kind of uh, prevent that. So um, go ahead and let's have you kind of sit on sit on top and with your right hand leg pull it up so we can see your knee, please. Yeah. All right. So it's always a good idea to take the tape, kind of just take the back of it here, line it up on their knee. Um, so people can go ahead and so you make sure that you have the appropriate length on here. So that's about right for, and then so when we go ahead and cut this, and again, please remember that we would use the other taping with it. This is just for visual purposes so people can go ahead and see the difference in the skin color. Um, 
So with this, typically you apply that first layer of um, like a white kind of sticky tape, like a pre-tape, so that way the tape's not directly going on top. So, and again, excuse my mechanics with this as well, so I'm trying to give you all the best type of picture of the, the technique. So go ahead and straighten this out just a little bit. So what we'll do then is in this particular study, there were individuals that were going ahead and they were actually facilitating, as you can see with the thumb pressure on there, they were facilitating a little bit of that glide. Um, I will disclose though that I have read research studies that have talked about you don't necessarily need to provide that glide on there with it. Um, clinically speaking, I find myself providing the glide, um, but there are, have been studies that have maybe tried to discuss that you don't necessarily need it. So if you anchor in at the patella, I always put the tape down a little bit just as an anchor point. So for my particular technique, I shift the patella over a little bit, strap it over with some tension, and then leave it be. With the other type of taping in there though, two strips pop typically at the top and at the bottom of the patella can go ahead and work well. And then this would be when you would have the, the patient go ahead and try their functional activity while it was going up and down stairs, squatting, seeing if you had a reduction in their pain. Um, if there was no reduction in pain, this type of tape, taping technique may not be appropriate with them, or maybe you just didn't go ahead and perform the specific tailored taping technique to the individual. Sorry. Okay. All right. So the next technique then that comes out is a mulligan technique. There it is. So this is done in more of a weight-bearing position. So this particular research study took a look at individuals performing a single leg squat. Um, and they had the individuals do a single leg squat with um, electrodes hooked up to see what type of muscle activation that they were getting. So individuals performed a single leg squat, three to five reps without tape um, as a control. They rested for about five to 10 minutes. Um, squat was performed to about 45 degrees of knee flexion, and then they applied this particular taping technique to the individual. So with the patient standing, with hip and knee internal rotation and the knee flexed to about 20 degrees, what you do then is you start at the, it's two pieces of superimposed uh, tape, um, similar to the McConnell fashion, and it's a spiraling fashion that you're gonna go ahead around the uh, fibula. So you tension from the neck of the fibula, you go over the inferior medial joint line, and then you go behind the knee. So you're actually not making any contact with the patella, um, which may seem weird because if we're treating patella femoral pain, why wouldn't we want to go ahead and contact the patella? Um, so the rationale and the thought process behind that is that if you alter the tibiofemoral rotation, this is going to reduce the amount of hip internal rotation. So once the patient goes ahead and stands up, that, that tape now becomes tighter, reducing hip internal rotation, almost kind of promoting and creating a hip, hip external rotation moment, which will decrease some of the valgus force that's on there. So with this particular, see if this, does it spin? I don't want to break it for you. So same type of thing with this particular one. Um, I'm going to move the table out of the way so people can see. I don't feel comfortable having it on the table. There you go. All right. So let's have you come on over this way. So again, same type of thing, taking the tape. Again, disclosure, you would use that Luco tape, that brown tape with it. Face me, please. So I kind of go ahead and I kind of get an idea of just the overall length of the tape that I'll need to use for the person before I go ahead and cut it. Scissors. Thank you, sir. Mark, could you pull up your... Yeah, uh -huh. you, you can use that one there. But yeah, that will be fine. So again, starting from the lateral aspect of the knee there, um, what you're going to do is you, you start right just below the fibular head, keeping it with some tension, avoiding the patella as you go ahead and as you go around the knee. So try to, or sorry, face me please, so there you go. 
So again, avoid my, uh, excuse my mechanics here as I'm trying to kind of just show you all what to, what to do. So find her fibular head. She's already in, just give or take, eyeball at 20 degrees of knee flexion. So find the fibular head. There it is. Going to anchor right here. Provide a little bit of tension. Go around the medial joint line. Behind the leg here. You okay? Mm -hmm. And then kind of wrapping up and around. I cut it a little bit long here. So just adjust this. Don't cut your patient. That's frowned upon. <laughs> and that's a lot of paperwork. So. So go ahead and, and face them. So that's that kind of wrapping and that spiraling technique in there. So the theory behind this then is when the patient goes ahead and performs that functional test, they would then go ahead and they would do that single leg squat. It alters the overall rotation of the tibiofemoral joint, thus reducing the amount of knee valgus that may be going on, or the, I'm sorry, the amount of uh, hip internal rotation, creating more of a hip external rotation moment. So that's just another type of technique that you can use. So the research on this one shows statistical significance as far as pain reduction um, at a four-week follow-up, but as far as a long-term follow-up, I wasn't able to find any research articles that promoted how it affects the individual after the long term. So just keep that in mind. So the, the statistical significance is good for a four-week period on here. The next one is that lumbo-pelvic high-grade mobilization in here with it. So some of you all might be thinking, well, why the heck would we go ahead and do this to somebody that has a patellofemoral pain going on? Um, so this particular study took a look at 28 athletes with patellofemoral pain, um, and they were assigned to randomly to two groups. One received a high-grade mobilization, as shown here, um, and the other one received a sham mobilization. So EMG studies were conducted, um, and they put it on the VM, the VL, and the glute med before and after the mobilization. Um, the patients then performed a step down or a single leg hop. Pain levels were then assessed. Um, and so what this ended up showing then was after that mobilization, the group that had this particular one um, had a statistically significant increase of onset firing of the glute med. Um, they also had an increased onset firing of the vastus medialis, but there was no statistical significance for the vastus lateralis. Now this goes back to that topic though of what's the clinical relevance of the activation time or the firing time or the increased firing of the VM, uh, the VM or the glute med. Um, however though, when they went ahead and took a look at some other outcome measures on the particular study, um, the, oops, Steve, I think I'm frozen here. Yeah, move it far to the left. Okay, there, you there go. I'm on it. Okay. All right, here. So what ended up happening then was that they also took a look at pain reduction for the individuals. So the statistical significance that they used for this was that pain dropped by on a scale uh, by two points, which was statistically significant for, for individuals. So um, what we'll do then is I will set her up for this, but given the nature of the table, I'll just set her up and I actually will perform the, the thrust maneuver on her just to make sure that she doesn't fall off the table. So let's go ahead and um, let's have you lay on your back. I'll lay on your back, please. So it's not going to be very comfortable with the there. But, okay. So what we want to do then is similar to what we've been doing if we would have any type of other lumbo-pelvic kind of mobilization. Side bend towards rotate away. So let's go ahead then, and I'm going to say that this is her symptomatic side then. So if I... Sorry, I don't want you to pull up. If I go ahead then and I side bend her towards the affected side a little bit, go ahead and put the hands just like that. Similar to what they're doing at the picture, they're asking, instructing the person to grasp through. So what you do is if you can feed through and rotate them, I'm going to lose a little bit of it on here. But if I can rotate them and stay, you okay? <laughs> I'm not going to drop you. I don't want to go in the doghouse. Um, so if you leave it just like this 
and you go ahead and you, you set them up, you take them to their end range, this is then when you would apply that thrust right through the ASIS to go ahead and get that mobilization in the cavitation. Again, at that end range point in there, I would set, I would take her a little bit more, take her to the end range, and then apply the, the thrust technique to go ahead and, and perform so you, to perform the appropriate mobilization. So that might be something also to consider incorporating. We can just leave it off because we have more manuals on here. Then. So <coughs> other manual interventions to consider. So this was a, a case series that was performed on five particular patients. And they looked at each individual patient and looked at their specific um, decreases in mobility and also their specific impairments. So individuals that showed hypomobility up near their hip received the high-grade lumbar mobilization. Um, if you had bilateral symptoms, they would go ahead and they would thrust on both sides. If you get a cavitation, they would go ahead and stop. If no cavitation was present, they would do a total of two mobilizations and then move on. Um, remember, though, to get the neuro neurophysiological effect, you don't always have to have that cavitation. Credit to Laura in the back there for that one. <laughs> Um, so then every individual went ahead and got the next one, which would be the inferior and superior um, patellar glides that would go on, specifically going into their restrictions. And I'll demonstrate these techniques as well. We're just going to kind of talk about all of them. Um, so what would end up happening then is you would take them into the end field, that kind of ca that end range of their tissue. You can either do a sustained hold or you can oscillate in the area. The last one, or the, the next two then, um, this is to, if you went ahead and you assessed somebody's hip and you had a capsular end feel, um, a caudal glide to go ahead and increase the mobility. And then lastly, um, the proximal tibiofibular um, non-thrust mobilization. And then you can actually um, perform a thrust in there too if you feel restrictions in the uh, tibiofibular joint. So, friends, go ahead and come on up here. So we already saw the top one. So. Um, you can long sit. That's fine. So again, what we'd have this one do is if you wanted to mobilize the knee, you kind of take a cupping technique, hand above, hand below, right at the kneecap. If I wanted to perform an inferior glide, I go ahead and I come down and I shift everything down with a sustained hold and I can perform little oscillations if we needed to. And then at the same time, you can go ahead and glide upward and at the, perform little oscillations as well. Um, the next one then, that uh, caudal glide of the hip, you can use a mobilization belt for this or you can use your hands. I prefer to use my hands. I feel like I get a little bit of a better feel on it. Make sure you disclose to your patients what you're doing. So go ahead and lay down on your back, please. Good. So um, what I end up doing then, if you let this leg rest so I can show it on here. So, I'll bet, so knee to 90, hip to 90, kind of relax in there. I'm gonna put my hands right by your by your groin. Get a nice, you go ahead and get a nice feel in there with it. A gentle distraction. Once they're at their end range, again, you can apply gentle oscillations, or you can take them to their end range and provide a quick thrust as well. And then the last one is the uh, tibiofibular non-thrust mobilization or high-grade mobilization. If individuals have pain with knee flexion, this may be because the might be some lacking some mobility in that tibiofibular area. So what you do then is you get a nice contact, get a skin lock. So start behind, kind of take up the slack of the tissue, get right at the fibula. So again, so taken from behind, bringing around, taking up the slack of the tissue. Um, and then from there, once the tissue is taken up, you can go ahead and take them down to their end range and come back in. If you feel once you get to their end range, up oh, there's a little bit of a restriction, thrust past it, and then yeah, it goes ahead and back down. So those are some different manual interventions then that you might want to consider to improve the overall mobility of the, the surrounding areas to the patellofemoral joint. Um, so with that being said then, does anybody have any questions? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, it looks like the, um, the high-grade mobilization wasn't started real so well doing that. Did the research mention that that was more 
of a decrease in pain because like the parasympathetic response than necessarily a biomechanical realignment. So that's something that we have to keep in mind with that is that when you do get that high grade mobilization, you do have those neurophysiological effects that do kick in there with it. Um, it didn't allude to that, but if we use our clinical relevance and we know what we know about the high grade mobilizations, can we really go ahead and tease out, does that happen, does that not happen there with it? Is the immediate decrease in pain a result of that neurophysiological effect? Um, but the research really didn't indicate one way versus the other. But given that the EMG studies did show that the firing activity of the muscles around the area did increase, um, I think that has to be pulled into question as well, pulled into play, saying maybe that increased activation is actually causing more of a support around the area decreasing pain. Yeah, good question, though. Any others? All right, very good. Here are my resources for the presentation. I thank you all for coming here this morning, allowing me to speak to you, and uh, thank you again for coming. So have a good day today. And if anybody has any questions, please feel free to shoot me an email. Thank you.